This week on The Wheelhouse. Local primaries in Connecticut are one month away. For Connecticut Public, I'm Frankie Graziano. This is The Wheelhouse. It's the show that connects politics to the people. We got your weekly dose of politics in Connecticut and beyond right here. And we passed an important milestone on the way to the September primaries. During the final week of July, local party committees had to endorse candidates. In Hartford on a Monday night, Arunan Arulampalam won a Democratic convention at the MD Fox School. He's running in an open race to succeed Mayor Luke Bronin. The next night, Paul Pernaruski got the support of Waterbury Democrats in another prominent open race. Incumbent mayors Joe Gannam, Justin Elliker were endorsed respectively in Bridgeport and New Haven. But as one candidate put it following the endorsements, the politicians have spoken, but now it's time to hear from the people. For more on the aforementioned endorsed candidates and their opponents, the primaries, and more importantly, context on why they matter, we got a tremendous panel of guests, two of them in studio today. First, I believe he authored that quote, uh, got it from somebody in the story that I stole that from, Mark Pazniokas, CT Mirror, Capitol Bureau Chief, to my left. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Good morning. Good morning. And also in studio today, Jonathan Wharton, the preppy prof, Southern Connecticut State University, the poli- p- political scientist of our lifetime. <laughs> That's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Jonathan? Doing well this morning. Thank you. And on the phone, the boss lady herself, editor of CT News Junkie, Christine Stewart. How are you this morning, Christine? I'm well. How are you, Frankie? I'm doing well. I'm getting ready to talk about the primaries here, and I got a, I got a question for you. We got the parties; they've spoken, but it, an endorsement doesn't necessarily guarantee victory in the primary. What happens between now and September 12th, Christine? What are folks doing right now? Well, they are um, looking to um, either petition their way onto the ballot, or they receive just enough support at that convention in order to. Um, squeeze on to the ballot. Uh, and, you know, September 12th, being a primary, kind of everybody's back to school already. It's probably going to be low voter turnout. But in the cities, in Hartford, in New Haven, in Bridgeport, the primary is the election because there is rarely a Republican who is able to compete in those Democratic strongholds. Mark, speaking of Democrats, Arun and Aru Lampalam, you were there endorsed by Hartford Democrats. Tell us who he is. Well, he's an interesting guy. Um, you know, identity politics are alive and well in Hartford and other racially diverse cities, but he doesn't check any of these standard boxes. You know, the the coalitions in Hartford usually are you know, you have a white base, you have an, a black base, and you have a Latino base. And uh, Arunin is, uh, he was born in Zimbabwe to uh, Sri Lankan parents. He came to the United States uh, as a toddler. Uh, and he lives in Hartford. He's married to uh, the minister of the Center Church, the historic Center Church. And his life is a little bit like a TV uh, movie of the week. Uh, he and his wife have five children, uh, two biological uh and three adopted. Um, and it's a multiracial uh, bunch. And they live on Hungerford Street, the heart of Hartford. They bought a burned out three family house some time ago, renovated it. And uh, they're very much vested in the city. Um, his oldest uh, children go to public school. And uh, that's been an issue for him that he has certainly emphasized. I should say for transparency's sake, Arunan Arulampalam's father-in-law is an executive at Eversource. He's also on the board at Connecticut Public. Hey, you were there the night that he got tapped by Hartford Democrats. From your reporting, I saw a few names of challengers that said they'll petition to get on the primary ballot. Who are they? 
So we have uh, Eric Coleman, who was a state senator uh, for many years, and then he resigned to accept a position as a superior court judge. Uh, he reached the mandatory retirement age of 70, and he's decided to have a, a second or third act in public life running for mayor of Hartford. Uh, John von Farah is state senator from the south end of Hartford in part of Wethersfield. Uh, he has a very important position in the General Assembly as the co-chair of the Finance, Revenue, and Bonding Committee. Uh, and then you also have Nick LeBron, who is uh, a member of the Hartford City Council, who did not get any support at the convention. Uh, and so those three are petitioning. Um, unlike state conventions, there actually is no automatic ticket um, to a primary, regardless of, it's not like with the state convention where if you get 15%, you're on, you got a petition. You so, got a petition, you got to get the And today's, today's a deadline. Uh, 4 p.m. today, you got to file your petition, so we'll find out. In a they got to be verified too, right? That's always the issue. <laughs> um, and um, there's usually back and forth on that. So we will find out, uh, you know, in the next uh, few days or weeks uh, as to what the actual primary ballots are going to look like in Hartford and, and Haven. And and then just one more chance to give here to uh, some of the other folks that are on the ballot that are registered candidates for mayor. Renardo Dunn Jr., Jr. Tracy Funny, uh, Giselle Jacobs, J. Stan McCauley. Any of these guys have what it takes to win? No. <laughs> Jonathan, the race for mayor in Hartford is an open contest, but it isn't in New Haven. Justin Elker, the incumbent, he's been endorsed by city Democrats. Right. And uh, I, I think that that's going to be an interesting race to follow, too. I, I think, Frankie, you remember you and I were corresponding or discussing about this whole cross-endorsement business between the local Republicans and local Green Party there um, for those who are trying to go against Elker. So we're going to see a little overlap of, of politics there. Um, and I'm still curious as to what could happen even in Hartford with the Working Family Party. I'm really paying more attention to that than anything else because uh, they're saying publicly they're not going to endorse anybody yet, but th that might be a possibility. Yeah, I, I don't know that either Funfara or Coleman are particularly attractive to the working families. So they, you know, they tend to focus on the council. They have replaced the Republicans uh, as far as holding the the seats in in a place like Hartford, where it's uh, everybody's elected at large. There are nine seats, and the Democrats can hold no more than six. So the working families have really, you know, zoomed in and gone after those other three. Back to New Haven really quickly. We got Shafiq Abdusabur, who's also in there, Liam Brennan, Tom Goldenberg, Wendy Hamilton, Macy Torres. Last two names I, I mentioned were unaffiliated candidates, but none of them Republicans. And you were talking a little bit maybe about a cross-endorsement earlier, Jonathan. Go go a little further into that and what that means. Well, the, the local Republican Party there has endorsed Goldenberg. So um, that's going on there in New Haven, which is kind of interesting to me, especially as a former Republican chairman there. Because <laughs> he's a Democrat. Yeah, well, that and – all right. So <laughs> for the record, I'm not a big fan of endorsing. And I oftentimes emphasize when it was under my tenure on the Republican Town Committee because I, I think it just gets really messy when you do something like like that and it gains more attention than it should in the past and i think you know christine and and Paz, you remember that uh you know my the person i replaced you know richter uh you know also was usually the one who would run it was just kind of a given that he he would run because that's typically the way it works uh and and certainly um, um you know that's not happening this time around so i i'm kind of curious as to you know where the direction things are going to go now um, for not just the Democrats, but even the Republicans. And also, I want to throw in the Green Party on, on purpose in there. Well, what is that, um, Jonathan, what, what does that mean, that, that the Republicans aren't actually running a Republican candidate? What does that say about the Republican Party in New Haven? Well, you know, John Carlson, who's the current chairman, has, has been running for a number of different offices. That's really nothing new, right, Christine? I mean, we've seen that happening when he's running for General Assembly and certainly has run for mayor before. Um, you know, and, and publicly, he's certainly been out there uh, against, you know, Elliker, too. Um, but I, I, I don't know all, all the internal detailings of, of what made their decision the way they did to, to cross-endorse. Another race we got to focus on here today, guys, an incumbent Democrat getting the party endorsement. Bridgeport, where Joe Gannam is still very much in charge of his city. Any of you guys have any inclination that this could end anytime soon? Feel free to jump in. Well, I mean, 
the issue will be what the actual ballot looks like. If, uh, you know, he has three challengers, um, Marilyn Moore, the state senator who came so tantalizingly close uh, last time, you know, John Gomes, um, who seems to be the stronger challenger, he's trying to suggest that Senator Moore's time has passed and she should clear the field for, you know, a two or three way race. And then there's Lamont. Uh, Daniel. And so, again, if you have a crowded race, that tends to favor the incumbent. Um, Joe Gannum, you know, we all know his story, you know, coming, you know, the the comeback of all comebacks, coming back from prison um, and unseating uh, an incumbent mayor and Bill Finch and then winning re-election to a second term. And now he's running for a third term. And of course, just for good measure, he decided to take a crack at running for governor. <laughs> and we, that didn't go well. We changed hosts of this show. It's a little bit of a different vibe. So can you just help uh, some of us who uh, may not have been around when uh, Mayor Gannum went to prison, <laughs> just to help us understand what Mayor Gannum did to go to prison? Sure. He, uh, he was a very young mayor when he's elected, and the succinct uh, version is he came in with a plan, as, as evidence uh, unfolded at trial. He came in with a plan to systematically uh, shake down people who were doing business in the city or with the city. Uh, and he went away to prison for seven years. Uh, and he's still fighting to regain his law license. Uh, he w- was rebuffed once again fairly recently. Yes. But, you know, they're, they're a forgiving bunch down in uh, Bridgeport. And he, he is a wonderful retail politician. I followed him around when he you know did his first comeback and he was going door to door. And the man has serious political skills. And by the way, in a city where... You know, you did have a lot of folks uh, who have had uh, encounters with the criminal justice system. You know, people had a different view and they're willing to give somebody a second chance. And they've certainly done that with Joe Gannam in Bridgeport. And their Democratic committee is really strong. I mean, obviously, Mara Tessa, among others, who you chair. I mean, they are really deterministic. And in many ways, they operate uh, machine politics in Bridgeport. That's probably the last of the real machines Mm -hmm. in in Connecticut. You know, that does not exist in Hartford. Um, the endorsement that uh, Arunin got in Hartford is significant, but it's just not like it is down in Bridgeport where, you know, uh, it really delivers on Election Day. So although, again, Marilyn Moore came so close. So. One might ask, though, if that machine can get in. the. We talked about identity politics earlier. I'm just bringing this up for the sake of talking about inclusion. So can that get in the way when you have potentially some history maybe that could be made in Bridgeport? If you had John Gomes uh, win, he'd be the first... Uh, uh, Latino uh, mayor in uh, in Bridgeport, or at least the chief elected official there. And then I think if Daniels or uh, Moore were to win, they would be the first black official to to lead Bridgeport. So does that kind of machine get in the way of that, or is or is or is Joe Gannum literally the best they got down there? Well, that's always the test. Um, yeah. You don't you don't know until until you run it, and you know that's what happens. And sometimes people are shocked that there's something organic that happens. But you know, as Christine said at the top, the turnouts in these things are terrible, even in. The, you know, the well-to-do suburbs, you know, where you get an 80 percent turnout in a presidential year. You know, I'm thinking a place like Wilton and, you know, their turnout in a, in a municipal is like 40 percent. It's half, um, you know, which is one of the one of the several reasons why municipal races are different from races for state and federal office. It's a it's a different electorate, literally on Election Day. I got two. Fi- right. Oh, go ahead, Christine. You, I didn't hear you on the phone. Yeah. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Um, you know, um, September 12th, uh, you know, and in Hartford, roughly one fourth of the registered Democrats participated in the last mayoral primary in 2019. So we're talking super low voter um, turnout. I mean, these guys are out knocking on doors, just trying to drag as many voters to the polls as they can. I want to come back to turnout in a second. I want to have Jonathan do two things for me. I need a favor from you. I want to ask you about more. We talked about how tantalizingly close she was last time uh, Pass said that. But uh, what do you think about her support this time around? It seems to be at least a little different. And then what about Lamont Daniels? What are you hearing about Lamont Daniels? So, Frankie, I think, and, and Christina, as you guys know, I've, I've been attending those city hall meetings because <laughs> I'm just fascinated by that city council meeting. And I've got some students who are actually in the innards 
uh, in the nonprofit and even on the campaigns there. So I've been hearing a lot in Bridgeport, more than I probably should. I think the problem is, I think you all know this, is that going back to your initial point, Frankie, it's very divided beyond you know the Joe Gannum stronghold, right? Because the interest in more the last time, and now we're having multiple candidates running, Gomes, who obviously worked prior to the Gannon administration, and then of course somebody like Daniels, who's been you know trying to do what he can to get out there. You know he's very he's been very supportive of more back and forth. But the problem is is that you're dividing up the support, the voters, and certainly the donors. And as a result, you're seeing that going back to Christine's main point. In Bridgeport, the turnout, if you get 20% there in the primary, that's epic. It tends to be, you know, in the, anywhere in the teens. So to divide things up further, that's problematic. I also don't want to forget uh, past main point, which I, I really like, is that that petitioning business is critical. And we're assuming that, you know, these candidates are going to get the petition. Remember, they have to get almost double the number because you got to be qualified to even appear on the ballot to get those voters who have actually been registered and participated in the last election. So there are a lot of factors that play here in terms of what can happen in Bridgeport. So what are we talking about as far as number of, of signatures that they need? Well, if I remember, I know Hartford is, what, 1,800? I'm forgetting what the number is in Bridgeport. It's, uh, uh, it's north of 2,000. It's like 2,033, I think, was the number that I saw. It's 1,600 in New Haven. It's mm. the percentage. You know, so it's it certainly should be doable. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's, there's a, a long history um, in all kinds of places, not just the cities, of, of uh, these candidates have – if they don't have s- significant volunteer support – they have to hire people to go out and do these uh, petition gathering. And bad things happen when you do that because yep. a lot of these folks are paid by the signature. And there's certainly some, you know, some examples of, of cases in which these folks have defrauded their candidate as well as the public. Um, which happened last time with Marilyn Morse. You know, yeah. That's right. That was it, a big it issue. It happened though. in Hartford years mm-hmm. ago. It's happened. Uh, I forget. There was a suburb that happened. It, it, again, it's, it's, it's one of the risks you take if you don't have the volunteer base to go out and do it. And then I uh, just want to po- provide a point of clarification here. Roughly 2,100 verified signatures you need in uh, the city of Bridgeport. Gomes is one of the people that uh, has reached out to the uh, to the media and said that he's collected enough signatures. He says he has 3,250 signatures. Of course, those have to be verified uh, right. by the town in order for him to qualify for the September 12th Democratic primary. Uh, just uh, zooming out just a little bit, I want to ask you about turnout. Jonathan, uh, in New Haven, we talk about a low turnout and that potentially benefiting who? The incumbent, because of name recognition. And, of course, we can't ignore that their Democratic Town Committee is very strong. I mean, I should know firsthand, right? <laughs> um, you know, and it's not so much that they even have the monies, the connections, or whatever. They have the unions. The unions are very concentrated in their power. And you might think, oh, they got the financial. Going back to Matt Pass's main point, I'm, which is critical, they do have the infrastructure because they have the volunteers who are actually part of the campaigns um, for all the races as well as for the mayoral races and particularly for the incumbent. So that is critical. Um, that is something very unique compared to other cities. I also want to emphasize we're back to the low turnout numbers in New Haven. Um, in the past, when it's usually a competitive race, I'm going back to Tony Harp versus Zelliker a few years ago, that's when it achieved almost that 25 26%, which was like huge. If we see anywhere near 20%, maybe 22 that would be very interesting to me for this time around for turnout. And who could high turnout in Hartford if that were to happen? Who could that possibly benefit in your estimation? And maybe I'm asking you to stretch out too far uh, on a limb here. Uh, but I don't think anybody <laughs> would it be maybe a Nick LeBron or something like that. I, uh, you I, know, I, I wouldn't even hazard to guess. And, sure. And I don't think we really need yeah. to go there because yeah. nobody, nobody's predicting a high turnout. It's right. ju- it's just the reality in the cities and. Um, even though it's an open race, you know, it you normally get a little bit more attention. You get some new blood. Um, and uh, but again, when Luke Bronin won the fir- you know, the first time and he unseated an incumbent, um, yeah, it was like 26 um, percent. But but Mark, the two things that are happening in Hartford, I think it's interesting is one, you know, he is similar to Luke Bronin. He's got the ties back to, you know, the administration, the governor there because, you know, he worked prior. Um, yeah. to Ned Lamont. And the other thing is is that uh, he's got a lot of money. <laughs> he 
he's been able to fundraise a lot of money compared to the other candidates. Well, Von Fair is is well, the first. He, he's you know he really is tapped into uh, all the interests of the capital mm-hmm. that he can mm-hmm. hit up. Uh, in legislative races, which are publicly financed, and there's also limits on what lobbyists can do. And so he he has raised the most money. Um, uh, Arunin's most recent quarter has been the best. So, I mean, the, the bottom line is they have enough money um, to do it. Von Farah and Arya Lumpalum, and which is, he's, the, the TV people are, are cringing, waiting for his election because uh, he does have a challenging class. But Von Farah has won a bunch of elections, so maybe uh, he could turn this thing around by then in terms of trying to get the turnout if it were to pop up. His so maybe di- that's another name to watch. His district has gone uh, heavily Latino. He has an alliance with Minnie Gonzalez uh, and her husband, Ramon Arroyo, who are kind of old old school district leaders, you know, Minnie's a state rep. Um, and that's what he's trying to cash in on. He's, he, he by his own uh, description, he has a very odd personality for somebody who's trying to run for mayor. John von Farr is basically an introvert and it works at the Capitol, although, you know, there are complaints from time to time he's hard to get hold of. And when you're the mayor of a diverse city, when you're running in a diverse city, people expect you to be everywhere. And Von Fair and I have had this conversation, and he acknowledges this would be a, a dramatic change for him, a change in operation. And, and you know, Arunin is young. He's, he's the youngest of the bunch. Uh, he's still in his 30s. And he's been door knocking for, for a long time. Von Fair just started door knocking um, by his own admission. Christine, go ahead. Well, I I think people need to understand how transactional Hartford politics are um, and how much shoring up each of the the racial groups within the Democratic Party is important to winning winning the primary, which is, again, the election uh, in the city of Hartford. And then, Christine, can I chime in on top of what you're saying? The thing about Hartford that you need to compare to other cities is that they get out there. Uh, and more importantly, they started a lot of these mayoral debates months ago at the beginning of the year, Frankie, unlike other cities. Hey, look at yeah, us. We made it. one tomorrow. <laughs> Good. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, look at us. We made it through three of Connecticut's most populous cities. Coming up next, Waterbury after uh, another one of those open races. Plus, what can that election and ones in Derby and Fairfield Tell us about what Connecticut voters are made of. Stay tuned after the break. You're listening to The Wheelhouse on Connecticut Public. This is The Wheelhouse. From Connecticut Public Radio, I'm Frankie Graziano. Neil O'Leary has been mayor of Waterbury since 2011, the longest consecutive serving mayor in the history of the Brass City. But that's all coming to an end. O'Leary said earlier this year he's not running for re-election. For more on the open race to determine O'Leary's successor in Waterbury, we're rejoined by Mark Pazniokas. He's in my left in studio. Connecticut Mirror's uh, Capitol Bureau Chief. Across from me, I got... Jonathan Wharton, the preppy prof, associate professor of political science and urban affairs at Southern Connecticut State University. And on the phone, Christine Stewart, editor of CT News Junkie. Mark Pazniokas, I turn to you. Can you help us with Neil O'Leary and why he's been able to sort of cook in Waterbury for so long? (laughs) You're asking me to explain Waterbury. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I'd love to know myself. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Very rare that somebody could do that, though, to, it, uh, uh, since 2011. It That's what, ten, it is. 10 it's terms? The, it's the center of the universe, as John Rowland was fond of saying. Um, so Neil O'Leary was an interesting factor, an, an, an interesting character in Waterbury politics. He has really stabilized um, city government. Um, you know, Waterbury has had some horrific experiences with its mayors, um, both in terms of corruption and then the the god-awful case of Phil Giordano, the abuse of minor children, um, using his office uh, to abuse these children. Um, So, you know, Neil O'Leary was a police officer for many years and then the chief. um, And he really has brought stability to 
City Hall. He has um, been very adept at building um, relationships with first with uh, Dan Malloy's governor, now Ned Lamont. Uh, he's been very focused on trying to get state money to um, remediate, you know, brownfields. You know, the the history of Waterbury is is a very proud one in in the Industrial Revolution and and with the brass mills. But you know, that's all gone away, and the city has really struggled. And you know, poverty is is uh, risen. Uh, it's a very diverse city. One of the things that I was curious to see this time is if you would see um, Latinos sort of exert their power because they are uh, growing in numbers. Uh, they've certainly elected uh, people to the General Assembly. But instead, you know, we're seeing the long term, the long time president of the Board of Alders who um, won the nomination and seems to be fairly well positioned um, in November. I think I said as a, I might have been joking about this or not, but uh, it's 10 terms for uh, for uh, for O'Leary. It's not that it's like four or five terms. So. It's every four years you, you vote for uh, mayor in the city of Waterbury. Nonetheless, Christine, another competition here in a big city headlined by a white man endorsed by Democrats. Uh, so far, four of the big of the uh, four big cities we've gone through, Arun and Arulampalam, the only person of color endorsed by Democrats. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Um, you know, I just want to also say that, you know, in the three big cities, the Democratic Party is run by... Italian men. So you have Mario Testa. <laughs> Sorry, guys. In Bridgeport. You have <laughs> Vinnie Morrow in, in uh, New Haven, and you have Mark DiBella in, in Hartford. So, you know, but it's not that the, um, the party machine, aside from setting aside Bridgeport, the party machine has, has as much power as they used to have back in the day. I guess I have to quit this job eventually and become a town committee uh, chairperson in Torrington or Glastonbury. <laughs> Francesco Graziano presents Party Politics. Uh, <laughs> why aren't we seeing, a, I think you harped on this a little bit, but why aren't we seeing a Latina candidate in Waterbury, Mark? Is it just uh, Paul Pernaruski maybe has the name recognition over there? He's the endorsed Democrat over there. Uh, that uh, the Democrats have tapped to try to replace uh, O'Leary. I, I don't know. I will confess I have not done any in deep dive into Waterbury. You know, you have uh, Jerry Reyes, who uh, is fairly prominent and the General Assembly's state representative. And the Black and Latino Caucus. Yeah, he, he was the past president of the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus. Um, um, again, politically adept guy, but, you know, not everybody wants to be mayor. It's a different gig. Um, you're on 24-7 um, in a city with a lot of needs. Uh, it really can be an exhausting job. I mean, you know, Neil O'Leary, you know, he hung in there a long time. You know, Luke Bronin after two terms, it's like he's done. Um, it It is, again, it's all consuming and it's not everybody's cup of tea. Well, the other thing, too, is that some well, of the government... I, I, oh. Christine, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, well, well, what do you think of the the Republican in Waterbury? I mean, could this be a situation not unlike um, Mayor Aaron Stewart in in New Britain, where you know the Republican Party does speak to um, the Latino community, which does tend to be more conservative um, on on some of these issues? Don Majorano, the Republican candidate, yeah, in Waterbury. and you know, it's funny. Um, there's a lot of old school thought about, you know, who you want to put forward. And I've had Republicans say, well, you know, her family runs a, a funeral home in Waterbury and it, it's been in business for 120 years. And when you run a funeral home, you, um, you're dealing with people in their worst moment. It's a, it's a very, very, you know, um, high touch <laughs> you know, business. Good bedside yeah, manner. No, intimate, no and, and but, right? yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, I, I've had Republicans say that could be an X factor here. So I, I don't know. But, you know, I think Christine's um, uh, probably the more salient point is, can they entice a uh, crossover, you know, from Latinos? Um, you know, O'Leary has had a good coalition that way. Um, so, you know, we'll see. But it's not like the Democratic endorsed candidate is a newcomer. I mean, he's he's been on the board of Alderman for two decades. He's been president for 
the majority of that time. And this is one that's going to come down to November, finally, of all the ones that we've discussed so far. Waterbury, you're going to have Majorano going at it with uh, Pernaruski there in November. We'll, I don't know how close it's going to be, but... Well, I think the fact that they have a, at least a competitive process there in Waterbury, right? That's unusual compared to the other cities. And going back to your point, Frankie, you know, Arunin, at least he, he's been able to tap what's going on locally in Hartford as a candidate because he's been on the Democratic Town Committee in Hartford for years. Um, and I think that that makes a big difference for anybody who's trying to run for office, especially citywide uh, campaigns like for mayor. You need to get within that party infrastructure to get your name out there, to at least develop up a base, and uh, to get out there. And so he's one of the few candidates who's been able to do that, of color, quite frankly, in South Asian and all. And I followed him when he was door knocking in the Blue Hills, which is a black, um, you know, middle class neighborhood in Hartford, decent voter turnout. And he was getting a great reception um, where he was he was door knocking, uh, including <laughs> including uh, he, he knocked on the door of Joshua Hall, who's a state rep, who yeah. obviously <laughs> is trying to stay neutral. But uh <laughs> Josh's <laughs> wife uh, was not neutral. She she gave him a big smile and said, "You got my vote." So, um, you know, he seems to he seems to be having good outreach in a diverse city. He's, he does not have one single geographic base, which sometimes that can be a liability. But in his case, you know, he's saying it, it's uh, it's an asset. A reminder to reporters this time of year and all of, all of us: don't shake hands or hug anybody uh, in public. Why That's that? a good story. Okay. What you just said with Josh Hall and his wife there. You know, you don't want to appear to endorse oh, a candidate. Oh, I That's see. Right. You can't I th- be I shaking thought, hands and hugging people. I, I thought he was doing a COVID thing, you know. <laughs> 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 I should forget that we just came out, out of the pandemic, and, uh, and, and for some, we're still uh, continuing to be in this. Hey, this next race, uh, just uh, something I want to say in, in terms of uh, Majorano and what she's telling supporters. She's saying she's a history-making candidate in Waterbury. First uh, woman endorsed a Republican. So we'll see uh, how that'll factor into the race. This next one that we're going to talk about that should also be competitive beyond the September primaries, Fairfield. In fact, I've been told that nobody has pulled petitions to try and force a primary with the endorsed candidates. It's going to be Democrat Bill Gerber taking on first select woman Brenda Kupchick for the right to lead Fairfield. What are you all hearing about Fairfield? You know, there's grumbling that. Cupchick could have some vulnerability, but it's, you know, part of it is Fairfield County has gone, uh, you know, very, very blue um, after being very, very red. And in Fairfield, there are no longer any Republican state reps. Um, The state senator who represents Fairfield is a Republican, but he barely won. It was 50 percent and and a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, But, you know, it's. I would caution people against comparing the, what's been happening in state and federal races with the municipals. Municipals are a very different animal. Um, as we talked about earlier, it's a much smaller turnout. Uh, so it's literally a different electorate. And also it's, you know, I mean, I, I had a piece today looking at a couple couple of things down there. And, you know, town hall is probably the last place in America where all politics is still local, um, that so much has been nationalized about abortion, other social issues, um, the questions about uh, Republicans still being uh, loyal to Donald Trump, uh, despite his election, you know, very discredited election denials. Um, But, you know, in the races for town halls, they still tend to be about local taxes. They can, you know, sometimes there's a local controversy over a housing project or there's personality differences. And you see that in some of these towns where, you know, I think it was Derby where the incumbent mayor was not uh, endorsed by the town committee. We're going to get into that next because right. that's an interesting case. But in Fairfield, what are we talking about with the de- – go ahead, Christine. You, you go ahead. And incumbency, incumbency definitely still has its perks. And and knowing Brenda Kupchak for years because she was uh, at the she was a state representative before she was elected for select minute in 2019. Um, she is not somebody who um, could be viewed as very partisan. She's somebody who's middle of the road, and you know what she's been dealing with in Fairfield since she was elected. You know, our environmental issues are, you know, about remediation of PCBs, um, you know, something that's very local and concerns the town, but 
there there aren't pretty politics in picking up the garbage and cleaning up an environmental um, mess. So cleaning I, the beaches. You know, I agree. Well, well the, yeah, the yeah, and that was thing. actually a corruption scandal. Her predecessor. I mean, it, he was not personally uh, right. implicated, but his administration was. And about how um, you know Phil was was dumped, and and that's how that's how Brenda unseated a, an incumbent. Um, you know, the only grumblings I hear now is it's again, it's a question of uh, are the Democrats better positioned? But it, it is. They do tend to be local things and unless you have some personal you – know, so, con- go ahead. Right, no, Mark. I, I was going to emphasize though the interesting dynamic is the RTC in Fairfield, right? It's actually one of the largest ones in, in the state. And so they have been divided internally. No surprise. That takes place in a lot of places where you have a, a lot more delegates, a lot more presence of an RTC like the one in Fairfield. Brenda Kupchak is very popular, but she does have her critics even within the party. And so I think you're seeing some of that – kind of unraveling right now um so uh but i i i I think just the incumbent factor she i think she can get this i I don't think it's going to be too much of an issue for this election we appreciate that report from our republican town committee correspondent (laughs) jonathan wharton thank you so much jonathan i was doing my old radio voice there i love it i get promoted now around here (laughs) hey i gotta i gotta i gotta zoom around here quick so i gotta jump uh jump off of fairfield but derby Derby, uh, Connecticut's smallest city where Richard Zekin, as Paz just mentioned, is the mayor running for re-election, but he doesn't have the endorsement of his party, yeah. the Republican Party. Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, because we're back to the divided RTC there in Derby, right? And even a little bit of what Mark brought out, you know, those who are supportive of Trump and those who are anti-Trump. Some of that does exist locally um, and twistedly. And in a place like Derby, which we can't forget is right in the center of Naugatuck Valley. <laughs> Where beyond just the Republican town committee, I don't want to exclude so many people who are Democrats who vote Republicans and then all those unaffiliated voters, which there are plenty of in the Valley, which could divide up. And we can't forget the last time around, you know, he narrowly won that race. And and it's, you know, one of the issues there is his relationship with people in the town committee, I'm told, his kind of, you know, he, he's not terribly attentive to them. So sometimes it's just that. It's it's political. It's personal relationships, particularly in a small town. But again, this is why, you know, and Christine can attest to this, that um, municipal to be a statewide political reporter and try to look for meaning in municipal races can be a, a you know mind blowing <laughs> exercise at times because you know so much of it is just hyper hyper local uh, as a, as opposed to general assembly races where you know people use common mailers and there's there's it's thematic and it does tend to uh, be something that's a little bit easier to analyze as opposed to uh, these races all over the place. Might be burying the lead here. Richard Seekin, uh, who has been dumped by Republicans essentially in Derby, has been replaced by a man who breached the U.S. Capitol in January of 2021. Uh, Di Giovanni, Gino Di Giovanni, uh, has acknowledged entering the Capitol on January 6th. He defended his presence there, saying hundreds of supporters uh, there were there to uh, voice their displeasure, says he didn't do anything wrong while he was in there and doesn't think he's going to get in trouble. I've also talked to the U.S. Dust- Justice Department about this. Uh, they said there's no pending case or anything like that that they could speak of or any charges that have been filed or anything like that. And but, he's the town chair. Yes. Yeah. So it's the town chair has taken the endorsement. So, yes, the question is, what is the Trump factor? What is the fact that this is the guy who the town committee has already elected as their chair? Uh, and the fact that Zeke, I'm told, is just, you know, he's not as attentive to a town committee as perhaps one should be in a small town. I shouldn't say there was no pending case. Uh, they just didn't have anything on him is what they said uh, uh, that they could share. And, you know. I, yeah, I mean, the, the Valley Independent Sentinel said he walked through the building, looked around, then walked out an exit to find his truck and head back to Derby. Just another tourist. We talked to a yeah. watchdog group, though, that said that if you were in the Capitol that day, you should be arrested. But well, that story on ctpublic.org, take a look at that story. Uh, you, uh, you, you, you take your own conclusions from that. Democrat Joe DiMartino will face off against the winner of the Zeke and Giovanni primary in November. Charlene McAvoy, also an unaffiliated candidate that handed in paperwork in Derby to run for mayor. 
I think we're done with Derby. <laughs> <laughs> we're never done with the Valley. I, thought, I was never, looking at Mark, you, Mark. Never. I thought you had something to say. That's why. <laughs> There's always to, something interesting in the Valley. Trying to give you the, the, the Iggy. If you, uh, if, you want to, if you want to move uh, west, I'd be just, happy just to really, say. Just you, really yeah. quickly, though, I want to get through a couple of towns here mm. before we move on to our last segment of the show. I'm each going to ask each of you to talk about a town we should talk about. Christine, go first. What about Wallingford? Oh, yeah. So, um, Wallingford. I, I forgot about Wallingford. Um, <laughs> so, you have, I think he might be the longest serving mayor in Connecticut. I think he's been there for close to, I don't know, four, five years. decades at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 82, I think. Um, you know. 21 terms yeah. for William Dickinson. <laughs> 21 terms, yes. Um, so, he is he is facing a, a challenge. So, that, that should be an interesting race. Jonathan, West Haven. Oh, West Haven. I'm always plugging West Haven because there are just so many. I mean, where do we begin with that? I I, I don't know. Uh, I guess with Nancy Rossi not running and then we have, you know, Dorinda, who, who, you know, Borger is running now. And, of course, her her husband's the former mayor from years ago back in the 90s. And, obviously, she's been a state lawmaker for, you know, a while, too. I'm very interested to see that all the cans kind of parted ways in the Democratic side. Then, meanwhile, on the Republican side, there are three candidates running um, so it's it's just a typical kind of West Haven, um, you know, divisional politics. But I want to see what that turnout will be like, especially as they're going through, you know, state re- review with the municipal. Mark, board. Mark, about a minute here. We haven't talked about Danbury. Yet. Well, so Danbury, it's a rematch. So Dean Esposito, the Republican who succeeded Mark Bowden, who had been there, you know, since before I was born. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eh, not quite. And but Roberto Alves, uh, he is an immigrant from Brazil in a city that is heavy, heavy foreign born. Um, and, you know, there was a there was a, a group years ago who described Danbury as actually like the 10th most diverse city in the United States. So uh, Roberto Al- Alves, he only lost by, I think, 290 votes last time. So that's one to watch. But that's one to watch in November, not in September. Give you one for the road here, Killingly. Remember what happened to Killingly right before the pandemic? People mainly without prior experience in politics or education got on the school board to change the name of the high school mascot. Well, that name uh, obviously uh, offended people in the town and some Native American tribes. But watch out for any movement on that nine-member board as Killingly School Board has five full-term seats up for grabs in November, plus an election for a two-year seat. And s- school boards are the one area in which all politics are not necessarily local, that you have had an infiltration of kind of national issues on critical race theory, book banning, transgender athlete rights, that kind of thing. You know, in Guilford, where there was a revolution, you know, and a a couple of years ago, uh, the Democrats aren't even putting forward a slate because they're in such disarray after that. So, yeah, school board races can be kind of funky. From Connecticut Public Radio, this is The Wheelhouse. One more segment after this. You're listening to The Wheelhouse. This is The Wheelhouse from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Frankie Graziano. Final segment, just a few minutes left. I'm going to turn to one of my guests here, Mark Pazniokas, and try to pull that thread together of the last segment we talked about where we spoke about Derby, Fairfield, Waterbury, and what they could tell us more about the evolution of how Connecticut residents are thinking politically. More broadly speaking, Mark, how residents in different parts of Connecticut, how may they look at the 2024 U.S. presidential election? (laughs) Yeah, I don't. Any think, of those races tell us anything? I, I don't. I don't. I really don't think they do. I think it's you know, like we talked about at the very end of that last segment. You know, some of the stuff that's going on in school board races. You know, these again, these national issues that have kind of found their way into local school board elections about you know uh, banning books uh, again, transgender athlete rights. The question is, what does that say about where people are in Connecticut? You know, in the presidential year, you know, Connecticut generally is not in play. Um, there's no expectation it will be in play this this time. But, you know, turnouts in presidential years go up. So the Democrats generally, you know, are well positioned, you know, on how it goes down ballot. But, of course, the X factor is, look, we have – a Democratic president who, if reelected, would be 86 years old at the end of his term. 
So there's obviously a lot of legitimate questions about the ability of Joe Biden to um, to perform. And then the the Republican frontrunner, not only is he facing three indictments, but he also would be um, after Biden, the oldest president. He would be 82 at the end of of another term. So we are in a place we have, America has not been before. Mark Pazniokas there. Jonathan Wharton also with us, along with Christine Stewart. You guys want to play off of uh, what Mark just said about what could improve turnout, what could kill turnout in the next Sure. Election. I mean, I think the, the big fear factor here is it's going to be a repeat of what happened four years ago in terms of you know what's going on with the president presidential race, you know, the same candidates. But I will go back and emphasize a little bit more to what Mark is offering, and that is turnout. We've got to see a bigger turnout, not just for the primaries, even for the general election, because obviously these closed primaries prevent so many unaffiliated voters from participating in the first place, whether that's at the town committee level or whether that's through the primary system. They've got to show up even in the general election to kind of demonstrate whether that will mean anything for national races, including Congress, by the way. So I, I don't think that the you know the local elections are necessarily going to play into um, the national elections and, and what happens there. Um, I will say though that the general assembly is looking to convene um, a special session to change the date of Connecticut's presidential primary <laughs> from the last Tuesday in April to the first Tuesday in April. Don't see how big of a difference that is is going to make and and you know, uh, when we get to election year. And Connecticut, even as a source of, of funding for presidential candidates, mm-hmm. seems to be fading a little bit. There is, I'm um, hearing from both parties, there is, uh, shall we say, a lack of enthusiasm uh, for big ticket donors regarding uh, Joe Biden or Donald Trump. Great analysis there. I just want to throw one more octogenarian uh, for you from Connecticut at you guys. Uh, what about U.S. Senator from Connecticut, Joe Lieberman? What about no labels? Uh, you guys got anything to say about that as we wrap up here uh, in the last uh, minute or so? Oh. I'm going to yield to the professor. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, You're killing me this morning. I, I will say that, that no doubt that presence factor is there, right? Because some people are saying that you know whoever they choose – um, that'll be a spoiler factor. And I wonder if, if that could be a possibility in seeing a turnout where maybe they could cut into whoever the candidate will be, let's say, 15 to 20 percent the way it was back in 92. Well, Senator Trump. Lieberman did so well for the Democrats in 2000. Maybe he can help them again in <laughs> 24. <laughs> We all had a nice, hearty laugh on that one. And uh, just just quickly before we end, uh, you can't say anything about age or talking about the, pre- the, the president's age or anything like that without saying that Connecticut is going to be the birthplace of God Save the Queen, man. <laughs> Were any of you guys in attendance when that happened? We joked about that on the wheelhouse. I was. And you, could not Joe hear, Biden. you couldn't hear it in the room. Um, okay. I guess it was clear as a bell on the feed. Um, and, uh, yeah, the question is, what the hell did that mean? Um, there was really no explanation. And, again, it's those things are funny. When you're younger, people would say, oh, that's just Joe being Joe. And, you know, he had a, a serious gaffes, right, talking about Barack Obama as being, oh, he's articulate and he's clean. And, yes, he's unlike those other black poli- – and, you know, Biden survived that because people just kind of shrugged. But now, you know – with his age being a factor, every stumble he makes is going to be looked at under a microscope. You know, with, you know, we all make those stumbles, but it's the stakes are so much higher. Oh, my God. And there's going to be a lot to worry about if you're Joe Biden on the way to the election, because, of course, you got the economy and uh, all the things you have to deal with as president. And for Donald Trump, the indictments, uh, maybe some challenges from other Republicans in the party, although it seems like he's doing well thus far. Great panel discussion on the upcoming primaries and beyond today on The Wheelhouse. Big thanks to Mark Pasniokas. Jonathan Wharton and Christine Stewart for joining us. Today's show produced by Robin Doy and Aiken. Thank you so much, Robin, for helping us out today. Technical producer Kat Pastor. Very special thanks to our interns, Stacey Otto and Carol Chen. Download The Wheelhouse anytime on your favorite podcast app. Contact the show. You can send us an email, wheelhouse at ctpublic.org. I'm Frankie Graziano. This is The Wheelhouse. Thank you for listening. <laughs>